Rachel. Okay, good evening and welcome everyone. And um, thank you so much for attending this virtual public information center or what we call a PIC for the MULOC Drive Multi-Use Pathway or what we call an MUP acronyms. Uh, my name is Rachel Prudham and I'm the Director of Engineering Services here at the Town of Newmarket. And uh, at this time, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of a few of our council members who are with us at this meeting. So I see that Mayor John Taylor is with us. And so is um, Ward 6 Councillor Kelly Broom. Uh, and the MUP does pass through her ward. So thank you, Councillor Broom, for being here today. Um, so uh, on the presentation panel this evening, on behalf of the Town of Newmarket are myself and Mark Krizanowski who is the manager of transportation services for the town. And he is also in charge of the active transportation portfolio. Um, our consultant on this project, WSP, won this assignment after a competitive public procurement process, which involved receiving proposals from various consultants. The proposals were scored based on price, understanding of the work and the objectives, and also the experience of the consultant team. So we're very pleased to have WSP with us tonight. So I'd like to now pass it back over to Justin Jones from WSP, who will introduce his team and explain the process for this PIC for this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Good evening, everyone who's attending with us and uh, welcome to everyone who's viewing the video live after the, uh, after the presentation is completed. Um, so we're really pleased to be here with you this evening to present our Public Information Centre about the Mulock Drive Multi-Use Path Feasibility Study. Just a couple of housekeeping items with regards to how this is going to work. Um, so we are in a, uh, a setting where you will be able to ask questions using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. All attendees are, in, are muted and will not have the ability to turn their video on but you do have the ability to ask those questions of our presenters using the question and answer. And at the end of this session, we're gonna show you an opportunity that is available for you to provide more detailed comments on the proposed uh, multi-use path alignment using an online tool called Miro uh, that provides you with the opportunity to comment directly on ortho, um, on basically overhead images of the trail alignment. So with that, uh, I will turn it over to our project principal, uh, Dave McLaughlin, who's going to lead you through an overview of the work to date and some of the proposed recommendations. Dave? Sorry, Justin, just before we pass it over to Dave, uh, my apologies, but uh, I do see that uh, Ward 5 Councillor Bob Quapis has also joined uh, the group tonight. So thank you, Bob, for being here. Thank you, Rachel. It's Dave McLaughlin. And uh, another member of our team on the call tonight is uh, Christina Valent. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. I'm going to take you through a presentation of the, uh, basically, it's an update of the status of this current project. We're looking for input from both the public and council on some of the ideas that we have developed based on our analysis to date. And I'm gonna walk you through that now. So the study area goes all the way from Bathurst to Cross, uh, going eastbound to Harry Walker Parkway. Um, our firm, as Rachel noted, we were retained in the winter of 2021 to assess the feasibility of a multi-use path along one side of Mulock Drive. So this is not yet a detailed design study, it's a feasibility study, but we are going to take it to a functional design level to help uh, town staff make a final determination on costs and to think about scheduling and moving forward and making a decision. It's a 6.3 kilometer section, so it goes right across the municipality. And uh, there are a number of commercial driveways along the corridor on both sides, but especially on the south. And you'll learn a little bit later how that's an important factor in the evaluation of uh, the various options. So the goals and objectives of the uh, project is to connect key destinations, uh, to navigate constrained segments, grades, utilities, um, 
for example, hydro poles. This is a great picture on the right. You can see how they sort of moved around utility poles rather than incurring the cost, which is significant of moving utility poles. Um, minimizing potential conflicts between users, especially at driveways. And we'll talk a little bit more about that today. Um, reusing existing infrastructure. Again, you know, there are some uh, asphalt multi-use pathways along the Mulock corridor. You'll see as we go through this exercise, we're trying our best to repurpose and reuse them in order to reduce the cost of implementing the entire facility along the corridor. To think about and accommodate future development as it occurs along the corridor, of course, is important. Things change over time and we want to make sure that we take that into account. And also to accommodate intersection treatments. There are new design guidelines in Ontario and in, at York Region uh, that provide guidance on better uh, use of pavement markings and signage and the use of color to uh, better allow users, all users of the roadway, to uh, understand what's happening at crossings. And we'll talk and show you some of those ideas today. So some of the design considerations, and this is looking now a little bit towards Bathurst at Sawmill Valley Creek. And you see uh, the John Smith Trail coming up from the valley below. Some of the considerations include connectivity um, to the New York farm site. We're going to show you that in a moment. Connectivity to existing trails. Uh, grade changes. It's important to try to come up with a design solution. Um, you know, cyclists and pedestrians always like to you know, have a nice gentle grade, and we want this to be an all ages and abilities type facility for youth all the way up to seniors. So that's very important. Constructability and cost. Again, consideration if we can repurpose existing infrastructure that makes the most efficient use of tax dollars. Guardrails, there are some locations where uh, we need to think about um, how we can put in the facility because there are constraints on some locations that uh, would suggest it would be better to be on one side of you compared to another. Existing utility poles, for those of you who are familiar with the corridor, there's a significant hydro corridor going through um, um, log and uh, one of the key goals is to not impact that hydro corridor and to work around it. And then adding cross ride intersection treatments, which I'll show you a little bit later in the presentation. Some of the other design considerations are um, how the multis pathway will connect to and pass by bus stops and bus shelters. It's really important that we design this in a way that everyone is safe and understands how everyone is moving about in the corridor. Frequency of commercial driveways, I touched on before and we'll talk a little bit later. The boulevard width is very important. Some sections of Mulock have very constrained uh, boulevards on one side. In fact, the sidewalk in some locations comes up to the curb. While in other locations, it's like this, where the boulevard is quite wide, there's lots of trees, and the sidewalk is set away from the uh, motor vehicle travel portion of the roadway. I already talked about using existing trails. Proximity to residential populations is really about along sections of the corridor um, there's more residential on one side than there is on the other. So that's this consideration as well. And finally, minimizing impacts to mature trees. Actually, impacts all trees is a big consideration as we work through the design exercise. So um, this slide is meant to show you some of the new treatments that have been approved in Ontario. And these guidelines are actually in York Region's design guidelines for cross rides. Um, so the top picture on the left is showing the markings if they were, these were low volume, you know, residential or small commercial driveways with very, very little traffic coming in and going. The one at the bottom left is for larger commercial driveways where there's a higher volume. The idea is to include uh, stencils and to reinforce perhaps through the use of color green, which has been adopted for uh, cycling infrastructure and, and multi-use paths in Canada as a way of really reinforcing to motorists turning in or out and crossing these paths that they really need to be cautious and, and careful when they're making a crossing. And this is all about vision zero and trying to improve you know, the way we design infrastructure, especially along our roadways. So here's a few examples um, of cross rides. The top left is at Bayview and 19th in Richmond Hill, where you see, and just so you understand what a cross ride is, when a cyclist approaches an intersection and it's a green light so that pedestrians can walk across, with this type of treatment, a cyclist can ride their bike across on the green light. If it was a conventional crosswalk under the current legislation in Ontario under the Highway Traffic Act, 
a cyclist is technically required to dismount and walk their bike across the crosswalk. So that's the difference between a cross ride and a crosswalk. Um, the drawing at the bottom is a mixed cross ride, which is used at driveways. You notice there's no ladder down the middle. It also tends to be a little bit narrower, even though this picture doesn't seem to show that. It is, in fact, a little narrower uh, than what you'd see um, at an intersection, at a signalized intersection. So what has been done to date? Um, we've completed a topographic survey of the entire corridor end to end. And the image at the bottom in shades of green is just sort of representation of that. Um, that survey collected all of the trees, all the utilities, all the curbs and catch basins, the width of the travel lanes, um, and all the other utilities that are in the corridor to uh, allow us uh, to better understand how best to locate multi-use trail and what impacts might occur if we shift the trail a little bit from where the current sidewalks are. We've identified three potential uh, options, alignment options. They're all very similar. The best way to think about it is one and two are primarily variations of being on the north side and alignment three is primarily on the south side along the corridor. And then there's a few, I guess option two does a little bit of north and south and, and you'll, I'll show that to you a little bit later. We also inventoried um, all the driveways along the corridor and assessed whether they were low volume or higher volume based on the lane use and the number of cars parked and the kind of activity there. We undertook a very detailed arborist report, which is a report where a landscape architect went out and completed a detailed review of all the trees, identifying their age, their location, the type of tree, its condition. We wanted to make sure that we understood exactly uh, what kind of trees we have. And if we have to remove or relocate some, we know exactly which ones we would do to try to avoid uh, all mature trees wherever possible is always the goal. We did a primary field investigation along the corridor as well uh, with our design team. And then we put the options together in a format similar to this presentation. And we presented it to a committee of a whole, um, town council on May 25th. And they had the opportunity to review some of the preliminary information. So I'm going to walk you through the corridor a little bit in the next few slides. So at the top, the red line is option one, alignment one, which is actually the alignment that uh, based on our analysis to date, we are recommending in draft as the preferred alignment. So keep that in mind as we go through the presentation. The green line is actually alignment two, and it just happens in this case, they follow the same side of the road. And at the bottom is the same section of road, but showing alignment three where it's on the south side. Um, so as you see, if you're going from Bathurst Street across to Columbus Way, you know, we are proposing that it be on the south side. It provides a better connection to the John Smith Trail that comes up from the valley here, approaching Sawmill. Um, and um, there is a guide rail on the north side that presents a bit of a problem. Um, and we do have space on the south side to repurpose the sidewalk between Bathurst and Sawmill Creek um, for a multi-use pathway. And it just happens that from Sawmill Creek across uh, to Columbus Way, there is an existing asphalt multi-use pathway already. So this section here, um, so we can repurpose that facility and, uh, and make it part of the corridor. Move to the next section now. So from Columbus Way, we're actually proposing to cross the north side. And the reason for this is, is one of the goals is to provide a great direct connection of this new facility to the future town park. So here we looked at a couple of options for alignment one and two. The red option stays in the road right away in a quite a large boulevard in place of the sidewalk, while the other alignment is considered going into the park. Um, through discussions with town staff and with the town's architects who developed the concept for town park, the recommendation was, and we agree with that as the consultants for the multi-use pathway, that the MUP should stay in the road right away and that there will be connections found from the town park site to the uh, multi-use pathway to provide access into it. Um, and having it on the north side provides a great connection uh, to this town park from everyone uh, in Newmarket, east and west. It'll cross Young Street here in the middle, you'll see, um, providing access to the transit stations that have been built, as well as the cycle tracks. If you've driven along Young Street or taken transit there or rode your bikes, You'll notice that are physically separated bikeways now that are off the road 
that are in the boulevard as well as sidewalks. And, and then there's a transit way in the middle. Alignment two um, jumps back from that little uh, invest exploratory route through the park site and continues at this point primarily on the south side. And you can see from these photos, I think, um, a little bit as we get along that how there are so many more driveways on the south side with commercial properties and driveways that generate quite a bit of traffic depending on the time of day compared to the north side. And yes, there are dealerships and other facilities on the north side, but when you look at it uh, in total, you'll, you'll understand where we're coming to come with our recommendation. So, from um, Sanford all the way across to the Tom Taylor Trail connection and entrance to Town Hall, we're proposing to come across to Kane Parkway. There's already an existing multi-use pathway that we can repurpose and use up to and the great connection to the Tom Taylor. It's almost an interchange, so to speak, for trail access. They don't have to cross the road and then continue beyond. And on this side, we have it on the south side. You can see that it's crossing so many commercial properties and driveways and re the reality in this area is more of the residential is on the other side. It's just a better choice to be on the north. On the next section, um, as we continue uh, through Stephen Court and through Bayview, um, a very similar treatment. We continue to stay on the north side. In this location, we go through this heavily treed area, which is a really nice section, and then continue past College Manor Drive. Um, we continue on the north side. Um, in this area where this culvert is, uh, there is very little space on the south side and the right of way. You can see the sidewalk here where it actually comes up and is abutting the roadway. Um, so it would be, there would be challenges to design and put in a wider multi-use path. There's a significant boulevard on the north side and it easily accommodates this multi-use pathway where the existing sidewalk is. When we get to the Magnus Center, it's really important to understand too how we cross. So, we cross directly to the Magnus Center and continue utilizing this off-road pathway. One of the goals that we're going to talk about in a minute, um, but I'll mention it here since this is on the screen, is you know this, this multi-use path will be really important for youth to use to navigate this key corridor and to access the Magnus Center and the future skate park that's in development that will be uh, directly beside off of Friend Bay. So this connection and crossing to this side just makes sense to provide great access to, uh, to youth, but also the seniors as well. Continuing as we continue down um, along the corridor to Leslie Street, um, we're trying to avoid these two areas, these subdivisions with the driveways. There are constraints on the north side that prevent us, um, uh, I shouldn't say prevent, but it is complicated to try to accommodate an MVP on this side. And there are sightline issues as well, especially this driveway. So having the trail on the south side um, all the way from Magna Center down to Leslie uh, is our recommendation. And this is the last section where we're proposing to cross here to the north side for the last section where it ends at Harry Park Parker, where the sidewalk is and the town's new uh, bike lanes that they've implemented. One of the reasons is um, A, because we want to tie into Harry Parker, um, but also there's quite a bit of traffic coming down Leslie and turning right at this corner, heading towards the 404. And uh, we thought it better for a lot of reasons to have the facility cross on the other legs. But as this goes through a design exercise, you know, how it crosses at intersections will also be assessed in greater detail. So how did we evaluate the options? This provides sort of a bit of an explanation of some of the key uh, evaluation criteria. So in terms of conflict mitigation, we, we were wanted to be very cognizant about conflicts between motorists, cyclists, and pedestrians, especially at driveways and intersections. Constructability and cost, which I mentioned before, things like moving hydro poles, shifting fire hydrants, and other utilities can be very, very costly, and you want to try to avoid it if you can. Um, access to uh, the trail from residential neighborhoods is really important, as well as key destinations. Transit impacts, I mentioned earlier, uh, making sure we can negotiate beyond and through concrete bus pads and still have uh, sufficient space for people who are accessing public transit to be off the trail. Um, tree impacts, again, um, want to minimize removals and, uh, and relocations where we can. Connectivity is the biggest thing. Uh, the town has been developing a fabulous active transportation network that you know, uh, is based on the spine of the Tom Taylor Trail System. 
um, just a fabulous facility. Um, and connectivity to that and other key destinations along the corridor are really important. And I mentioned this very important component of you know, providing access to youth and seniors is something that also influences the decision of where we put the trail and the design of the trail as well. I mentioned driveway frequency before. And the last one is a common one used for analysis. Um, but in this case, it doesn't really, uh, evaluate, it doesn't really uh, side with one north side or south side because it's pretty consistent along the corridor, which is intersection frequency. So the results of the analysis, the draft analysis is this table. So the red color, which was uh, the recommended option to date and draft, option one uh, was ranked first, followed by option two and three below, um, which is the results of our analysis. And you will all have the opportunity to download this presentation from the website later on. Uh, it's posted now there on the website. We'll provide you a link later if you want to digest this a little bit. Um, so I want to also talk a little bit about the arborist review, which is the tree impact review. So every single tree, so every number you see here represents a tree. Every single tree along the corridor end to end in the right of way was assessed um, and identified. And as a great um, value add for the town, for them to be using in the future, to understand the kind of trees they have, their condition, and how old they are. So uh, the arborist and landscape architect um, made the assumption that our trail will probably be three meters wide, but we assumed a 3.6 meter clear zone down the center of the existing sidewalks on both sides um, to do this analysis in order to give us an idea how many trees might be impacted, how many might have to be removed. But as you can see in the point in bold here, the intention is to maintain, if not exceed the number of trees. So we have to relocate some of the younger trees that can be done. And if some have to be removed, then new ones will have to be planted. But the goal will be, there will still be the same number of trees and hopefully more. So how many trees are being impacted? Option one, there are about 89 that could need to be either removed or relocated. We might be able to reduce that number by shifting the alignment of the multi-use trail a little bit um, to avoid um, more trees. Um, and there's about 123 that are in the impact zone but won't have to be removed. But they'll have to be monitored over time to see um, how they're doing because they'll be a little closer to the facility than typically is preferred. In option two, there are more trees that will have to be removed or relocated than option one. And again, more that will, have, will be impacted and have to be monitored. Now option three, if you were only looking at tree impacts, looks like it's the best because it only has 67 that would be impacted and 89 that, sorry, 67 that might be removed and 89 that might be impacted. The reality is there's far, far fewer trees on the south side than there are on the north side. So that's really the reason why that number is lower. Okay, so we have an interesting um, now part of the presentation um, that we're going to show you, which is uh, an aerial video that shows you the entire corridor. I'm gonna bring it up and uh, it'll take a second, so bear with me. I'm just gonna wait a second for the signal to improve a little bit. So we're gonna fly through Mulock, starting at Bathurst Street, going east to Harry Walker. And I'm gonna pause at a few points to uh, just provide you with a bit of input. Now this is the draft preferred alignment, which is the red line that we talked about earlier, um, because showing the other colors would make it a little more confusing. So I'm going to start now and walk you through it. So give me a second. So as we approach Sawmill Creek, you see the John Smith Trail coming up, linking to that side of the corridor. And if you look carefully, you'll see that there is an asphalt pathway on the far side of Sawmill Creek, and no sidewalk. So we're utilizing that existing facility, while on the north side, it's only a sidewalk.
Now at Columbus Way, we make a turn. So the multi-use pathway that's on the south side ends. And as you can see, the sidewalk then continues from Columbus Way on to Young Street on the south side, which is okay because we actually want to move the facility across the road to pass by the new town park site, which you'll see now. So we're following the existing sidewalk down the center line. This is the town park site on your left. And there'll be future access points to the MEP for the future park. Now, this photo is a little dated, um, a couple of years. So it doesn't show the constructed um, transit stops and then center medians or the cycle tracks. But for those of you who pass through this intersection, you know they're there. And this provides a fabulous connection to it. Continue on the north side. And as you look at this video, remember what I had said earlier about driveways on each side. Um, you'll see along sections here, this is a good example where there's far more on the south than on the north. So we continue along this corridor, coming up to College Manor, Kane Parkway, sorry. Now at Kane Parkway, there is a section of a multi-use pathway on the south side that we can repurpose and use. It might need to be, and likely will need to be improved as part of this project, but the corridor width um, is there for, and we just need to modify it slightly. So we continue towards the Tom Taylor Trail system. We are here right now. And again, this operates almost like an interchange for those of you who use the trail system. I hope many of you do. Going underneath the road avoids any need to cross it at the surface. You can come up and access the trail system here. Um, and if you're coming along here and you want to go the other direction, you would simply come down go underneath the road and come back up and continue southbound. Um, it also provides a direct access to Town Hall, which is the next driveway you'll see in a moment as we continue on our way, which is right here. We'll cross the rail corridor with them in some enhanced signage and improvements, continuing on the north side past Stephen Court. Again, busier driveways on the south side. Cross Bayview through this heavily treed area is our design choice currently. Continuing along the north side, to College Manor. Again, we we'll continue on the north side now. This is a good location where if you see on the south side, the existing sidewalk is very close to the curve of the roadway. And there's a guide rail here um, and a water course that goes below. While on the north side, there's significant space and it's far easier and more cost efficient to implement the facility on this side. We'll continue on. Gain more residential on the north side than on the south. And now we approach the Magnus Center where we are changing direction and crossing the road again. So we'll be proposed through cross rides that I showed you earlier, one across here and one across here. And by the way, at all signalized intersections where we cross the road, we're proposing cross rides. Uh, the future skate park will be down this side of Fernbank, so youth and, and everyone will be able to cross, access the Magnus Center, access the future skate park. Um, we're also proposing to utilize this existing multi-use path with some modifications on the south side and continue all the way down to Leslie Street on the south side. And I'm just going to advance it a little bit. You'll see on the left side, there's two driveways, the one for the mall and the one for the school. And this road is on a grade coming down in this direction. There's a lot of reasons why um, we would like to uh, discourage people, especially people on bikes, going past those busy driveways because cars tend to be going in and out at a little bit faster than usual because of the grade issue. Uh, so it's another reason from a safety perspective that having it on the other side of the road uh, provides a better choice for us. Now, in terms of the high school kids and others who want to cross the street, there is a brand new traffic signal that's been implemented at this location, a pedestrian signal. Now, it's not in this photo because the photo is all dated, but believe me, it's there and you will see it if you drive by, which provides uh, the ability for people from the school to cross and utilize the trail system in a safe way. We'll continue down the corridor, we're nearing the end. There are those driveways on the left I mentioned to you about where we have constraints. And at Leslie, we're both proposing to change again, partly because you know there's a significant volume of traffic turning right to go to the 404. And really people on the trail were taking them to Harry Walker and it's on the north side of the road anyways. 
So for us, we thought this would be a good location to make that change. We may have to shift the guide rail a little bit that exists here on the north side, but we're working on that. Right now, we think we can accommodate it. We may have to narrow the trail a little bit to do that or shift the guide rail, but that's uh, something we'll figure out in the next design option phase. And then we come up to Harry Walker and that's the end of the video. Um, so I'm now gonna exit the video and switch back to the presentation. So bear with me for one moment. So I'm now gonna pass over um, to Justin Jones, who's gonna walk you through a really cool tool uh, called Miro that will be up on the website and you'll be able to access it for a number of weeks where you can go in at your own time and leisure to provide comments and to see what other people are commenting about directly on the roots on these drawings. And then we'll be recording that information um, after that time and putting a summary together to provide to staff and to share with council. So over to you, um, Justin, I'll stop sharing, correct? Yeah, you can stop sharing, Dave, thanks so much. Um, so I do wanna highlight that the, the link to the Miro tool will be on the project webpage. So you'll be able to find it. You don't have to worry about all the, uh, all the gobbledygook at the end of the link, but I'm just going to show you our Miro board and I'll give you a quick demo of how this tool works. So there we are. So Miro is an interactive whiteboarding tool. And for the purposes of this particular project, you will be able to comment on any of the ortho images, the overhead images of the corridor that you would like. I'm just gonna give you a quick demo of how to use the Miro tool for your comments. So there is a little description here in terms of how to use the comment function. So you see there's a find it. So you look for this little comment button on the left toolbar. This will be a lot easier when you're using it as a user rather than myself as an administrator because none of these tools will be here. It'll just be the comment feature just up here. So you click on the comment button and you can just drag your comment right over to wherever you would like to comment. Now I'll leave it here. And as soon as you drop that comment button, it allows you to type your comment. So I'm a coffee guy myself. So I will send that. Now, when you click on, when you go to the Miro link, you will have the option to either provide your name or to comment anonymously. If you provide your name, your name will be displayed on any of the comments that you leave. So if you do want to comment anonymously, uh, feel free to do so. We will be moderating the comments. So anonymous comments will be subject to more stringent moderation. Um, so we'll make sure that there are uh, that there are no inappropriate comments coming through. So you can zoom in on the maps here and you can place comments all along the corridor quite easily just by clicking and dragging and dropping your comment. So you can locate your comment exactly where you want it to be and type something here like combined cross rides are great. Sure. Um, and you then also can edit those comments. So if you, like me, made a mistake and you wanted to maybe make cross rides, instead, you can go in and edit it. If you want to delete your comment, you want it to disappear, you just have to select the entirety of it, hit delete, and your comment will disappear from the board. Now, unfortunately, you cannot move your comment once it's dropped. So if you put it in the wrong spot, you will have to, you can either delete the comment or just leave a note telling us where you meant to put it. Um, it's your choice. The other nice thing is that you are actually able to respond to comments from other users. So if someone has a comment here and they want to ask like, what is this? Uh, I mean, I can respond to my own one here. I can say this is a red line. And then that comment goes added on. So you can respond. It can actually maintain a bit of a conversational tone. 
for, through this tool where you can ask questions and our project team will see those questions pop up and we'll be able to answer those uh, as we go through this process. So I encourage you to take a tour on down the entire length of the corridor, provide your comments. It looks like we've already got some comments here, um, which is wonderful. So we're really uh, looking for your feedback on this as we move into the next phase of the project. Um, I will also just note, if you wanna see all the comments, on the bottom here, you'll probably see it just these two little arrows. Click the two little arrows, and if you click the comments button, it will allow you to see all the comments just as a text list, so you can see what your neighbors are saying about this project and what kinds of questions they are asking. So I encourage you to go on and uh, play around with the Miro board. Um, it really is a, a pretty powerful tool. Uh, and I'm just going to switch over to our PowerPoint again. And slide. There we are. So we would ask that you provide us your comments and uh, that you review our proposed alignments and uh, tell us which one you think is the best choice for the town of Newmarket. Um, Dave, anything else you'd like to add? Anything else from the other project team? No, we're going to try to answer a few questions at the time we have left. Absolutely. And, uh, Justin, if you could leave actually that up on the previous. Sure. Slide. Yeah, so you, everyone, you can see the link up there. You can click on that link um, if you access the file on the uh, on the municipal website. And that Oops. on the second slide is at the bottom, newmarket. Sorry, Dave. There we go. Uh, newmarket.ca slash MUP, which stands for multi use pathway. And uh, you can download the file. You can go to the link. Um, I think you pasted the link, uh, Justin, in the, um, in the chat box. Question so box. I can't put the link in the chat. Okay. So unless someone asks the question, so I kind of need one of our, I need one of our attendees to just ask a fake question. Like, can you put the link in? And then I can put the link in. Great. Okay. Um, well, maybe someone would do that. And then they, you can all go in and just click on the link in, the, in that box and it will take you to the tool. Um, now, the goal was not to, for you to use the tool during this open house meeting, but if you are able to access it and you want to, you're welcome to. The goal is over the next two <laughs> weeks, over the next two weeks, we would like you to, um, you know, review the tool, review the PowerPoint slides. You're welcome to email questions to Mark or myself, which is on the next steps and contact info slide, um, or and go to this tool and put in your comments. Um, we'll be uh, sharing and summarizing all these comments with council at a later date, and we'll be meeting with staff to look at all the comments to see what your ideas are and to understand how we might be able to modify or refine the design uh, based on the ideas that come forward from the public. So it is really important that we engage you and that you share your ideas. Um, and if you have specific questions that are not exactly related, you know, we will try our best to answer those as well. Um, they may not be today, it may be as part of the uh, summary of this public open house that we will also uh, post on the website um, in a week or so, actually, it'll probably be after the closure of the online tool. So it'll probably be closer to three weeks. Um, but we'll make sure that, uh, you know, we, we share through social media, that the comment summary is there. And we'll also put a reminder out to everyone in, that we can through our connections uh, in a week or so that the tool is still live and they have an opportunity to review it and also an opportunity to download this PowerPoint presentation and review it. Mm -hmm. So back to you, Justin. Thanks, Dave. Um, so if you go into the Q&A, uh, you should be able to click on the response that I sent to uh, Jill Tomsack Redmond's question. Uh, she said, what's the link? I put the link in there so you can click on that and that will take you to the Miro board, anyone who's attending right now. So we do have a couple of other questions um, that have come in. And so uh, 
I'm wondering, do we, uh, we have a question here about uh, many of the intersections on Mulock have a large quarter radii, which is associated with greater vehicle turning speeds. With the introduction of the multi-use path cross rides, will corner turning radii be reduced to improve pedestrian and cycling safety? So that's a really good question. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll, take a, I'll answer that first, and then Mark or anyone from the town would like to add. So when we go in and, and retrofit these intersections to put in cross rides, most of the time, we're actually just widening the curb cut that you currently use um, to cross as a pedestrian where the crosswalk is. Sometimes there are other modifications. We might have to push a, a light pole or we might have to move one of the traffic signal poles a little bit further back. If there's a center concrete island that there's a light pole on or, or traffic light on, we might have to push it back a little bit as well. In terms of redesigning the geometry of the intersection, that's not typically done as part of putting a crossing in for a multi-use pathway. It's usually done at the time when that intersection needs to be re rehabilitated. Um, but you know, it is a regional road and, and we can share that comment with regional staff so that there are improvements from time to time that are coming along MULOC, including some this year where they're doing intersection improvements. And the question about reducing the curb radii is an option. So what does that mean? By reducing the curb radii, you're actually um, forcing motorists who are turning to go a little bit slower to navigate. It's a little bit of a sharper turn. And the benefit of that is reducing speed. Um, new design guidelines in Ontario are, are actually pointing to reducing these curb radii as we rebuild our roads and build new roads. They'll, they'll increasingly become um, um, tighter radii. So, uh, and that's all about encouraging motors to travel more slowly through an intersection, especially when they're making turns. So it's a really excellent question. Thank you for it. Can I add, uh, Dave, also that uh, we recently learned that York Region will be doing some work at some of the intersections along Mulock. Um, so the intersection at Mulock and College Manor and the intersection at Mulock and Bayview will be under construction but it's not really road construction. They are really just upgrading the traffic signals, the traffic signal lights. Um, and they are adding some, um, some features for the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, the AODA standards. So um, some plates at the intersections and uh, visibility issues. Uh, the intersection at Mulock and Bayview will also include some resurfacing because um, York Region will be resurfacing a part of Prospect Street. So uh, just if you see crews out there, it's not part of our MUP, but we are aware of this work and uh, it won't affect the radii though, the turning radii. They're not doing full reconstruction. Great, back to you, Justin, for questions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there is a question here about a quarter that's outside the scope of the study that uh, maybe we'll, we'll hold on to until the end if we don't have any questions directly related to this. Um, but what's the width of the multi-use path? Um, so typically in these boulevard pathways, um, they're about three meters. If we have more space, um, we can try to shoot, shoot for four meters. Uh, many of you probably have heard of the term micromobility, um, but if not, it's the concept that uh, we're rapidly seeing more and more electric bicycles coming on the market. They look like conventional bicycles, but more people are getting them, um, especially seniors, and finding it very convenient to travel. Um, so, you know, we want to make sure that we can provide space for everyone on these multi use paths, pedestrians, people, you know, walking with their baby carriages and dog walkers and joggers. So if there's an opportunity to widen the trail, we can, but typically in multi-use pathways in boulevards like this, three meters is about as good as you can get. Um, because once you start to push it further, you start encroaching onto numerous trees and uh, utilities. Um, so I expect that it will be three meters, but that's, you know, we'll take that back to town staff as well. And, uh, you know, they may ask us, for example, you know, what if we widen it to three and a half meters or four meters, what would be the cost implications and the impact to trees? So that's a really great question to ask. Thank you. There's quite a few questions here about intersection treatments, Dave. So we'll kind of go through them 
Sure. Uh, what is the difference between a bike box and a cross ride? So a bike box is a storage space for a cyclist to park into. Often, if it's in front of a motorist, uh, they can get up in front of a car uh, at, a, at a light. And when the light changes, the cyclist is in front of the car and then proceeds through into the bike facility. You can also have corner bike boxes where cyclists will travel uh, through an intersection and instead of turning left in the left turn motor vehicle lane, they'll go through the intersection and go into the queue box in the corner and wait for the light to change in the other direction and then they'll proceed through. So it's like taking an L shape. So those are really the two typical types of bike boxes that we have. One um, for lower volume roads where it's on the asphalt and it sort of allows bikes to sort of jump in front of cars a bit so that motorists, you know, see them um, in, in, at, for those first few seconds when the light turns green and for left turning vehicles. Uh, and then what uh, cross ride then right. was the, the second so part. Cross, cross ride is very similar to a crosswalk. So it, it's meant for cyclists to cross through along that corridor. Um, the advantage with a cross ride is a cyclist is allowed legally to ride their bike through the crossing. If it's a ladder or a, a traditional pedestrian crosswalk, which almost all you see out in Newmarket today are, um, legally a cyclist is supposed to dismount and walk their bike through the crosswalk. Now, we know that that doesn't happen that often, but that is the law um, that uh, pedestrians are not allowed, uh, sorry, cyclists are not allowed to cycle through a pedestrian crosswalk. But cross rides, they are, um, and that's the big change. Um, and the reality is more and more municipalities are beginning to implement cross rides along their multi-use pathway systems. Um, and motorists will also understand when they see these markings that they will understand that in those locations, bikes are not just, you know, they're not getting off their bike. They're actually riding through and they have the right to do that. Great. Um, are there any cross rides currently in operation in Newmarket? That's a great question. Mark, I don't think there are, are there? No, not yet. So these will likely be the first cross rides in, in Newmarket. Um, there are others in Richmond Hill and Markham. Um, and I don't think there are any that I can think of in Aurora. Um, so I think Newmarket will be first if you're competing with Aurora, which by the way, that's where I live. Um, so, um, and many municipalities are rolling them out. Um, the design guidelines in Ontario have evolved over the last three or four years. Um, it was only two years ago that York Region approved the new standard for cross rides. Uh, so it's a fairly new facility type. And again, it's meant to improve safety. Great. Uh, so we have some questions here about uh, cyclists triggering traffic lights. Um, is there going to be uh, push button signals to activate the crossing signal or, and is there leading pedestrian intervals being considered along the multi-use path? And for those that aren't familiar, because we're, we're getting into a little bit of, of technical jargon, um, you know, the buttons, the, the button activated signal is one where you push it to be able to cross to activate the signal and leading pedestrian intervals are a, uh, a relatively new signal phasing that gives people walking or people cycling a head start ahead of uh, turning and uh, moving motor vehicles. Well, that was a great question. So let's let's start with the leading pedestrian interval question. Um, no, that's a, a traffic signal operational treatment. It's not necessary for the cross ride. I suspect what will happen over time because we believe this will be a very, very popular facility. As volume increases, there will be, um, you know, uh, opportunity to review the signal systems at these intersections along the corridor with York Region, and they may consider providing a little bit of additional head start time. So what does that mean? That means when you have pedestrians and cyclists who come up to a red light, and cars that come up to that light and one are wanting to turn, when the light turns green, the pedestrians and cyclists actually get to go first. They get, you know, two, three, sometimes four seconds when they can start moving across and the motorists are held back until their light changes. So it gives them an advantage and also puts pedestrians and cyclists in a better sight line of motor vehicles, especially those turning. Um, so major urban cities are, are starting to introduce that treatment. And the other question was? Uh, are there gonna be the actuated signals? How, how are they, right. are people cycling gonna be activating the signals? Right, so 
um, all the all the signal systems are are on Mulock, I believe, are fully actuated, which means that the, they uh, they have a time system. But I could be wrong. Um, and meaning that when motor vehicles approach, they trigger the signal system. For pedestrians and cyclists, there is a push button system um, that will be available. So similar to a pedestrian, they'll be using the push buttons that will be installed. Now the push buttons are part of the AODA improvements. The York region is slowly installing across all the intersections to be uh, consistent with the uh, provincial built environment standards. And it takes time to implement those, uh, but the answer is yes. Wonderful. Uh, what additional safety measures will be implemented at the railway crossing? So there are uh, specific design treatments um, with uh, signage and pavement markings. And, you know, typically for a rail corridor, I know those of, the, of you who are familiar with the Tom Taylor, further up, there is a trail rail crossing of the corridor that has arms on it, uh, signal arms, similar to, you know, uh, what you would see for motor vehicles. Um, Metrolinx owns that corridor. And it is likely that a similar type of uh, signal system will be installed. But given the future plans Metrolinx has for a future station um, in, Mule, in the Mule Lock area, the improvements to that corridor will probably be held back until such time as um, they move forward with that. So we likely won't see arms put in. There may be a gate system, for example, just to slow cyclists down a little bit as they cross through and enhance signage. And that's consistent with Transport Canada's design guidelines for trail crossings and rail corridors. So we'll ensure that the design treatment that is being proposed is consistent with that. Great. Um, there's a question here about uh, how will cyclists traveling north on Leslie access the multi-use path east of west? So if they're traveling north, on Leslie and they want to go east, they will likely pull in on the right, wait for the light to change, and then cross through the cross ride um, and continue on their, on their way. Okay. Um, cyclists who are traveling south on Leslie approaching me a lot, they'll ride through the intersection and then they'll enter the multi use pathway on the far side, on the right hand side. Or if they're destined towards, uh, you know, the Magnus Center, they'll pull off into that waiting area where pedestrians would be and cyclists at the trail and wait for the other light to change and then continue their trip uh, going uh, westbound. Great. Um, are there any identified property impacts of the preferred routes? Uh, we have a question here from a Condo Corp that directly borders the preferred route. Uh, and they're asking if this means they would potentially lose part of their property to the creation of the multi-use pass. So the current design is completely within the municipal road right of way. So there's no, we currently don't anticipate any property impacts in order to accommodate the facility. Uh, there is a question here about if this is a shared path for all uses or if there are specific lanes for pedestrians and cyclists? Great question. So it is a shared path for all uses. On the other side of the road will continue to be a pedestrian sidewalk. And on the side we're proposing, there'll be a multi-use pathway. So it'll be one pathway for multi-use for cyclists and runners, dog walkers and, uh, and pedestrians. And people using mobility devices. Absolutely. Um, there's a question here about was there time and money spent widening the Leslie and Mulock corridor, and is that to be redone? I'm not I, sure I, if that. Yeah, go I, ahead, Rachel. Just ensure. Um, yes, uh, Leslie Street was reconstructed by York Region. It wasn't the town of Newmarket that did the work. Um, and they did add bike lanes as well on both sides of the road with bike boxes. They're painted green. They look very nice. Um, and Mulock was resurfaced by York Region a few years back. 
uh, but it was not widened. Uh, they put the same line markings back in. We tried to get a bike lane on Mulock at that time, but it wasn't uh, wasn't the right time to do it. And and as luck has it, now we're looking at an off road trail, which is much better than uh, than the on road uh, bike lanes. So, um, and to answer the actual crux of that question, uh, no, we will not be redoing any of the work that was there. So there are no throwaway costs on those projects. They were completely different and um, all of our construction will be off-road uh, in this particular case, except for the crossings that will be basically just line paintings. Fantastic. Uh, so there is one more question and since we do have time, I will throw it out there. Uh, and that's if the town has collected any safety stats on the London Road bike lanes. Uh, they're wondering if traffic has calmed on that corridor. So I guess that would be for town staff. Okay, I guess that would be for me. Uh, L London Road and uh, both Alexander <clears throat> were completed sort of in the fall of last year. Unfortunately, with, uh, with COVID, we didn't have a, a great deal of time and, and opportunity to do any real decent counts and specifically on London because we have uh, Canadian Martyrs and uh, Diné Public School there that would impact the, the road and the operation. So we're hoping when everything gets back to normal as much as it can in September with the schools, we'll be doing a full review of both uh, Alexander and, and London. Mark, could you maybe add just a little bit in general on uh, the traffic calming effects of bike lanes and if we do have an idea of how, how much uh, effect it has had on other roads? Right. When we constructed the east-west um, uh, bike route bike route through the town, so that would be, uh, it was on Shrigley, uh, Prospect, Timothy, been on Main, been on Park, um, and Millard, uh, we had found that we would we could get anywhere from uh, really no impact to up to uh, eight kilometers uh, in um, reduced speeds, uh, depending on the section and depending where it was. So there is a, a you know, general reduction in, in speeds on these streets. And we're also in, uh, looking at, in, in hopefully in the fall, to see if there's any uh, secondary impacts on the crossing streets. So you get sort of a, a halo effect on, on speeds. So we're, we're expecting uh, some some from that as well. Uh, I can't comment on collisions right now because that's sort of uh, another another part of uh, uh, the COVID experience we're trying to work our way through. But um, we have found that there is reduction in speeds generally. Thanks, Mark. Fantastic. Are there any other questions, Justin? There's a oh, there is. Uh, one more that, well, there's a comment that just came in uh, and that's that um, with it being a shared path, perhaps information on proper sharing of the path is necessary to distribute to residents. Um, just commenting about how proper sharing of the path in terms of pedestrians stopping unsafely, taking up the whole path or cyclists speeding past pedestrians without giving adequate space uh, is definitely a concern. That's a concern we hear all over the province, I would say in most, in many of our projects. and. Um, doing those kinds of public awareness campaigns are, are you know, always recommended when installing novel infrastructure. Uh, a question here is, how will cyclists attending Newmarket High access the bike lane to travel eastbound? There's presently only a sidewalk on the north side of Mulock between the school property and the crosswalk. So a lot of the students that are accessing the high school are actually doing it via College Manor and around. Um, and that are, some are riding on the sidewalk as well, but we were also observing that activity. And, you know, um, it, it's really tricky. Sidewalks are for pedestrians, except for really young kids when they don't have the cognitive abilities to cycle on the road. And then most municipalities um, will permit them on sidewalks, not all. Um, but youth who are older really shouldn't be sharing that small concrete space with, with uh, pedestrians. So. We, that's a really good point too. Similar to the question that was raised about trail etiquette, about you know putting information out about how to use the trail system. I think it probably would be appropriate as part of the messaging uh, should town council select to proceed and complete this project to also share information through the school uh, and the board, but through that school about the new facility and how to navigate through the intersection um, and using a cross ride because many of those kids won't know what it is. Um, so it would be a good idea to share that 
and also to provide some information about how to use this multi-use pathway to access the high school. Absolutely. Um, so there was one more question it was just asking, and this will be our last question. And it was asking if, uh, if this is more of a recreational or uh, a commuter and active transportation route. And I typed in the response and said that uh, this is one of those really amazing projects that, that is, the answer is both. Um, it has such incredible connectivity to recreational routes but because of the linear and connected nature of this corridor, it really does serve as an active transportation and commuting route as well. So with that, I will move on to the final slide, which provides some contact information and some next steps. And so I will uh, toss this over to Dave to wrap us up. Thanks, Justin. So um, as I said earlier, we're gonna review your input and input that will be coming in over the next few weeks on this draft presentation and the draft alignments. And there were really good questions tonight. We're hopeful that we're gonna get more like that because those are the kind of questions that help us you know, revisit the design and think about how we can make it better. And did we actually address you know, some of these issues? So thank you for these questions. Um, we will refine it, um, the, um, the alignments um, and in discussions with town staff, make a final recommendation on the preferred alignment. Um, then we're gonna move forward with the functional design, which is basically creating design drawings for the corridor and developing a cost estimate. And that's the key deliverable of this assignment actually to share with town staff, which will give them the information they need to confirm that it can be built and to understand what has to be modified along the corridor to implement it and how much it's expected to cost. And then the report will go to council. Um, with the findings and a staff recommendation. Um, and it will be up to council to decide uh, if they have any questions, is there something else they want to have us look at, or um, you know, will they table it for future consideration as part of a future capital project, which will be for their, their decision. Um, and that will be the end of the project for us. Um, but during the entire course of the study, even after this two week window, if you missed the window, but you still have a comment or a question came up, please don't hesitate, reach out to us. Uh, this information will still say on the um, website with the town until the conclusion of the study. And we encourage you to be as engaged as you're, you can be over the course of the study. And I think I will uh, end it and pass it over to Rachel, maybe just to conclude if you have any final re remarks before we uh, wrap up for this evening. Sure, I, I would just really like to thank everybody who participated tonight who is um, uh, benefiting from this presentation and would strongly encourage you to use the Miro tool to put post-it notes on, on all of your um, areas of concern with your questions or comments or suggestions. Um, for those who went to the PIC for the East-West bike route, we basically did the same thing, but we had paper on the table and we were putting actual post-its on. So this is the next best thing, I guess. So hopefully uh, you will be able to do that. I believe the, um, the two week period, we will extend into the weekend. So uh, Sunday, June 27th would be the date that we close the um, online uh, commenting. But again, like Dave said, we'd be very happy to receive any comments or questions beyond that period as well. So thank you again, everybody. Have a wonderful night, and we look forward to your comments. Good evening.